everybody. Okay. Hey everybody, this is our fifth online class, I believe. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, Protestant Reformation. We're going to have two classes on, on the subject today and, and Thursday. Uh, Thursday's class. You know, in, 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 if, if we were in our classroom, I'd have that big whiteboard here full of information for you, and I myself would work off the off the whiteboard the way, I, the way I do when we're teaching, but we don't have a whiteboard, so it takes a different kind of presentation, it takes a different kind of attention on, on your part. But we, we're close to halfway done now, and this topic is worth two classes. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really important. Uh, we have a four-part handout uh, that we'll get to you in a, as timely a way as we can. Uh, the first section is called Luther Starts the Reformation, and the second section will do both the two first, the first two ones today. The second section, England Becomes Protestant. The third section for Thursday, uh, the Reformation Continues, and also Thursday, uh, the, Catholic, the Catholic Reformation. Now, I want to define those terms for you, Reformation and Protestant, but first I want to try to tie this in uh, with where we ended uh, last class. We ended last class talking about Christopher Columbus. And we saw that this, this, this great, brave, knowledgeable, tireless uh, sailor, lover of the sea, uh, lover of God, uh, accomplished a great deal, but he did not accomplish what he set out to uh, accomplish. Uh, what he had hoped to accomplish was to find a good direct connection between Europe and the Far East by sailing west. Uh, but instead of finding a connection with the Far East by sailing west, he ran into a three-continent roadblock uh, between Europe and the uh, Far East. He ran into what we know to be North America, Central America, and South America, all of which became, all of which became Spanish. And so it was perfectly obvious to everyone except Columbus that the old land routes, for Spain at least, uh, were going to be better than the new uh, land route, which now has a huge roadblock to circumvent and still a long way further, still a long way further to go. Uh, he was also disappointed, Columbus was, or would have been disappointed, to see that uh, the second coming, which he so yearned for, he, he believed that God's reward for Christian uh, society would be for its bankrupting Islam by taking the trade routes out of the Middle East and putting them on the high seas. Uh, he believed that, that would bring about the second coming of Christ uh, and time as we know it uh, would come would come to an end. Uh, he didn't he didn't see that. Uh, he didn't see us tap into he didn't see us tap into the wealth of the uh, Far East, but he did see well, we all would soon see uh, Spain batter its way into the wealth of the Incas in Peru and the Aztecs uh, in India and still maintain the terms of the Treaty of Tordesillas by bringing Christianity to the, uh, into parts uh, unknown uh, in the uh, rapidly, expanding, rapidly expanding world. So we didn't, get, we didn't get the Far East connection, or Spain didn't get the Far East connection, and Christianity didn't get the second coming of Christ. Uh, what Christianity got instead was an explosion, an explosion of protest, an explosion of faith, an explosion of fervor, an explosion of fury uh, that changed the world as every bit as much as Columbus's and the other voyages uh, had, had changed the world. And that explosion uh, we call the Protestant Reformation. Uh, it was a long time, it was a long time coming. Uh, it had many deep-rooted causes, uh, but it was sparked uh, by one event and one man, uh, Martin Luther, uh, in Germany. Uh, nailing to his cathedral church's door 95 propositions uh, that he was willing to debate with anybody the church would put into the ring against him, uh, so to speak. Uh, 
That was an act of protest. And when you see the word Protestant, I want you to see the first two syllables of the word, protest. A Protestant is a protester, and the protest is against the church, against the status quo church, against the church that, as, that had come to be what it was in the early, 15, early 1500s. Uh, Reformation is the form that this protest took. And when you see the word Reformation, see the first two syllables, reform, as in redo, or reset, or reshape, or renew, or overhaul, or do over. Uh, again, start anew, start from the beginning, reform. Uh, a person can reform his character, person can reform his behavior, and the Protestant Reformation is to bring about a reforming of, a, of the church's character uh, and a recapturing of the church's original purity and straight and narrow to its original, to its original function, its original, its original character. It had many causes. Something like that has to have a lot of causes. And on the first page of the handout, there's a section called uh, The Causes of the Reformation. Uh, I want you to read it uh, just to get a sense of where we're going with this, but skip the picture of Savonarola on the front page and the, the story of this strange Italian preacher that follows. And go instead, after you read the section, The uh, Causes of the Reformation, Go back to two classes ago. Go, go back to a century in turmoil, or a turbulent century, whichever one that, that was called, in the 1300s. And we, we talked about all the body blows that the church took in the 1300s. There was the plague in 1348-49, uh, the uh, schism, or the split in the church, two-way and then three-way in 1371. And then there were the reform demands of John Wycliffe. And Wickless protest that the church had become too fascinated with wealth, too prosperous in land, too involved in politics, too worldly as opposed to being orig as it originally had been a spiritual institution. And John Huss, even more so, taking up all of those ideas from uh, Wycliffe and adding to them the, the questioning that Huss uh, asked about. Uh, the supreme miracle of them all in the sacraments, the bread and the wine changing substance to body and blood in the uh, sacrament of the, of the Mass. And we've talked about the execution of John Huss, the, the church setting its face against reform, uh, fearing it and suppressing it. Well, all of those things carry over into the, into the 1400s. Uh, as well, and if you if you if you go on with uh, if you go on and, and look at the uh, Renaissance, uh, look at the uh, Northern Renaissance, look at humanism, look at Christian humanism, uh, you can see all of the criticisms that the Christian humanists uh, made of the of the church. Uh, they mocked the church, they satirized the church, they, they pointed the finger of ridicule at the church, they accused it of hypocrisy. Uh, when push came to shove, when Luther blows up, and he's going to blow up here in just a minute, when Luther blowed, blew up, uh, the Christian humanists, however, hung back and did not go uh, with him, did not become protesters. Uh, of that of that kind, uh, they were afraid that an explosion would lead to a total permanent split in unified Christianity, and that that split would last forever, it would not be healable, and they were right, and so they hoped against hope to save the church from itself by pointing the finger of criticism and shaming it, so to speak, into changing its ways. Now, the church was not nearly 
as far gone as the Christian humanists and soon the Protestants make out to be. But in many areas of Europe, it was bad enough. And in 1517, uh, this, this protest and sense of dissatisfaction uh, made a connection uh, with Martin Luther. So let, let's talk about Luther. Uh, we'll go now to the second page of the handout. And I want you to read about Luther, especially uh, that column in, in the right-hand margin uh, of, 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 of the page. Uh, Martin Luther uh, in 1517 uh, was a very young man uh, who had who was all his life a, a good Christian. As a matter of fact, in many ways, he was straight out of the Middle Ages. Uh, he didn't live a normal life. He, he lived the life of a monk. He, he was a monk. He lived a life of poverty and of chastity and obedience, of hard work in the fields and of hard work in the writing room scriptorium. And the work in the writing room, that hard work, mirrored his, 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 his vocation. He, he was a professor of biblical studies at the University of Wittenberg in, in Germany. So he is a, a young Christian man uh, concerned with the, the truths of Christianity and, and the Christian message, but he was tortured. He was mentally tortured. He tortured himself mentally. Uh, he was afraid that in spite of all he was doing, emphasis on doing, in spite of all that he did, of all that he was doing, he was afraid that he wasn't going to measure up and he wasn't going to achieve salvation and flat out wasn't going to go to heaven. And he wondered, what more can I do, do? Can more be done? And there you have the doing again. Is it possible to do more? Again, the emphasis on doing or on performing good deeds or in theological terms, salvation by works, salvation by deeds, salvation by doing, uh, as if to say, doing everything one can to change God's mind uh, about uh, your fate, the fate of your, of your, of your soul. In 1516 or 1515 or 1516, uh, Luther thought he had found an answer, uh, but it, it's going to take him a little while to work out the, the consequences of it. He found the answer, he thought, in the book of Romans. He was a professor mainly of New Testament studies, and in lecture preparation, uh, he came across a passage in, or he saw in a new light, a passage in the book of Romans uh, indicating, pointing out, revealing uh, uh, the idea of justification or salvation, salvation by faith. Uh, and Luther is going to insert the little word after faith, alone. And that set his mind uh, somewhat at ease uh, until the following year, 1517, uh, occurred the event that triggered this mighty explosion that's just now around the corner. And that event was the appearance in the German-speaking world, Luther's part of the German-speaking world, the appearance of a famed profess professional seller of indulgences. This infuriated Luther, as, as we'll see. But let's first understand what an indulgence was. The word means pardon. And the idea had grown up in Christianity. It had grown up in the, in the 11th century, if not before. The idea had grown up in Christianity that upon death, the souls of hell, the souls damned to hell, go there like an arrow to the target, drop like a stone. But for those who are saved, 
the vast majority of those souls uh, don't go directly to meet God. They go instead to a place called purgatory. Uh, they, they are saved, but they had fallen in one way or another short of uh, the correct uh, faith uh, in uh, God's will and the goodness uh, of God. And purgatory would be a very, very long process for them. Their stay in purgatory would be very long. Uh, until such time as their proper instruction had taken hold and they had corrected through repentance and a kind of a rebirth had corrected the deficiencies in faith that held them out of heaven for this for this very long time and i say a very long time because if if, if you had lived 90 years uh your, your instruction in purgatory would not begin for 90 years you, you, you'd wait for as long as you had had lived, but then you, you, would, you would learn and achieve the, the knowledge and the, the, the personal uh, involvement with God that, that every Christian uh, longs for. You know, what a prisoner, someone in a penitentiary or a penal institution, longs to hear more than anything else, hopes to receive more than anything else, however long a sentence is, is time off for good behavior. And indulgence is a little slip of paper that came in all sizes, I should say all amounts, none of them were very expensive. It's a little slip of paper, a certificate that puts before the knowledge of God that you have earned time off in purgatory for good behavior. The good behavior being your purchase of this thing, this certificate, this indulgence, the yield for which what the money you pay goes to the well-being, goes to a good worthy cause as the church has decided them to be, like a coin in the collection plate, a, a good heartfelt contribution. Uh, you, you can see that, that this whole thing that trots right up to the edge of what religious morality ought to allow. And it was real easy to run right over that edge and come to believe or come to be tricked into thinking that what you were doing was buying your way into heaven. Uh, you, you were not. You, you were buying time off in purgatory for good behavior. But that's a real fine, wavy, blurry line, and it was, it, it was a bad situation that should have been stopped a long time ago. As many people in the church realized, it, it should have been stopped. And Luther was not the first, by any stretch of the imagination, to condemn these things. Wycliffe had, Huss had. It was easy to condemn them. Uh, they were money makers, though, and it was hard to do much hard to do much about them, or the church found it hard to do uh, much uh, about them. That's the way it is with abuses sometimes. Luther looked on an indulgence, though, in a different way than anyone else before him. Uh, he saw an indulgence as a good gardener sees a weed. Uh, and you can do two things with a weed. Uh, I'm assuming you want it gone. Uh, you, you can cut it off at ground level, or you can go after the root. And cutting it off at ground level is going to put it into dormancy for a while, but it'll be back. But get the root, and you solve the problem. Luther thought that the root of the indulgence problem, where that's coming from, he believed that was coming from the theology of works. That by the man who tortures himself to do more can do this more, can buy an indulgence or more than one. 
and more than one time during his or her life. And until you get the salvation by doing out of there, you haven't touched the root of this thing, and you're going to be plagued with the problem. And Luther is going to go after the root. Now, again, he hadn't fully worked this out uh, by 1517, but what he saw in the Book of Romans led him to believe in three fixed principles of theology. And this is, he had 95 different ways of framing this, uh, these, these three principles, which he hammered into the cathedral door as a challenge uh, for debate. And the first of them was this, that salvation comes by faith, period. And Luther slipped a little alone in there that's not exactly scriptural. And what he meant by that was that the Christian needs to understand that what's in God, what's in your plan and your hope may not be in God's plan. The, the Lord's Prayer, after all, talks about thy will, not my will, be done. And what salvation by faith means is having faith strong enough in the goodness of God and the rightness of his plan to go along with whatever decision is going to be, is going to be made, that you may not be included in salvation. Not everyone will, Luther thought. But by keeping the faith, you maintain your faith in the rightness of God's plan and the goodness of God's will, irrespective and unmindful of, of the consequences uh, to come. So that's a pretty tall order. That's just not believing in God. That, that's, a, that's a very tall order. And the second point that Luther wanted to make theologically uh, in 1517 was what I just got done explaining to you uh, about justification by faith and every other Christian belief, this is the second point, Luther meant to say that everything that is revealed to a Christian, revelation, everything that's revealed to a Christian is revealed in Scripture, period, and nowhere else. Scripture. No church council, no church laws, no papal announcements called bulls, no uh, papal uh, policy arrangements, uh, policy changes, or policy announcements of any kind. It's scripture and scripture alone. Case closed. And then the third point uh, that Luther wanted to make uh, theologically was that all Christians are equal in this. And all Christians being equal, and the handout is very good on this point, all Christians being equal, there is no need for a special cast of Christians. There's no need for a special hierarchy between you, me, your brothers, your sisters on the one hand, and God on the other. We don't need priests. Not needing priests, we don't need the people who choose priests, the bishops not needing any bishop. We for sure don't need the number one bishop, the Bishop of Rome. And if we don't need the Bishop of Rome, we don't need the cardinals, uh, the electoral college uh, that chooses uh, who the, bishop, the next Bishop of Rome is, is going to be. And so we, we, we swept all of that out and we replaced them replace the whole rigmarole uh, with what are called ministers. And the word minister implies much more of a shepherd, much more of a caretaker, much more of a servant than the word priest does. And the ministers are not going to wear special garb. Uh, they're not going to live apart. They're going to be allowed to marry. Uh, they're going to be allowed to uh, they're going to be allowed to marry, and they are going to preside over religious services, but not as middlemen, more as servants or as, as uh, shepherds. So this, these, these three points are, are, are dynamite. Uh, these three points sweep away 
just about everything in what you call the stat, the church at the time, the status quo church, all, all, all gone, all, all, all thrown out. The monasteries and, and all of the deeds that Christians were used to doing, going on pilgrimages, for example, uh, going on crusades. Luther at one time would have done all of those things and was in fact a pilgrim at one time, but all, all of that's gone now. And what it's what replaces it is the trust in God's righteousness, the trust, of course, God's righteousness, but the trust in God's plan, that it's thy will, not my will. And if your faith is strong enough to live with that, whatever the outcome might be, then you are very much a candidate uh, for, uh, for salvation. And you can take comfort uh, and peace uh, in that. Uh, peace was what Luther wanted above all, above all things. He 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 knew Scripture as a young man. He lived it, uh, but he didn't he didn't know he didn't know peace. There was a, an important corollary that went with those those three points, and, and your handout is very good about this corollary or this this come along with principle uh, that's on page four hundred and thirty. Uh, Luther believed that uh, many of us are going to be unlucky enough, uh, Protestants though we may be, if we are, many of us may be unlucky enough in the world as it was arranged then uh, to live under the authority of a Catholic ruler. And Luther was very emphatic about what you must not do were you in that situation. Uh, you must not disobey secular political authority under any circumstances. Outwardly, in the worldly life, you do as you're told. Inwardly, you are free. And it's the inner freedom that counts for everything and the motions you go through to satisfy this ruler or that ruler or the other ruler, those, those are meaningless in the, in, the, in the larger context. So there's absolute obedience uh, to civil authority. And when in the German world there were uprisings against Catholic authority uh, or uprising uh, against the, the authority of, of uh, aristocratic landowners, as in the Peasants' Revolt that the, tech, that the handout describes. Uh, Luther was emphatic. Uh, he, he, he was emphatic. The, the, the rebellious peasants, Luther thought, needed to be hunted down, hanged. Uh, disobedience is the, is the worst thing imaginable. Luther needed those German rulers to reform the church and they were not to be questioned, uh, whatever their faith, whatever their religious profession uh, was. They were, they were not to be questioned. Now that's going to change a little bit later in, in the Reformation, change a lot a little bit later in, in the Reformation, as we'll, uh, as we'll see. Uh, but Luther was adamant uh, about that, no questions, no question about it. He was, he was dead certain on uh, obedience to civil uh, authority. Uh, the immediate outcome of Luther's explosion was a half century of religious war. Uh, Protestants would say uh, that these were wars of aggression that were forced on them, uh, maybe not, not easy to read the history of it. Uh, atrocities, uh, numberless atrocities committed by protesters or Protestants on the one hand, Catholic authority on the other. Nothing to choose from between the amount or the extent of, of atrocities. The worst kind of war is always a religious, religious war. And it ran that way in Germany until 1555. Now, Luther was long gone by 1555. He'd been dead 20-odd years 
by 1555. But in that year, a settlement was reached uh, whereby it was reached at Augsburg in Germany. And the treaty was called the Peace of Augsburg. It's covered in the handout. Uh, and it laid down that whoever the ruler was of a particular area, he would decide on the religious affiliation of that area under his control, and you and I would live with it. Uh, whose authority equals his religion uh, in, in other ways. Uh, Luther would have been fine with it. Uh, and for the time being, it quelled uh, religious warfare uh, in, in Germany. It put, it put a halt to it. Not, not for long, as we'll see, but it did put a halt to it. By 1555, uh, the Reformation uh, has spilled over from Germany, primarily because of the printing press, has spilled over from the German-speaking world into uh, the wider world, and particularly uh, into uh, the pages of English history uh, and into the English language. And we have one page in the handout uh, so far uh, about the Reformation coming to England. Uh, and I want to finish up uh, with that. Understand that in speaking about this chapter of English history, we, we are actually talking about chapter two of American history. Chapter one of American history, look in any American history book, chapter one of American history revolves around Columbus. Chapter two of American history revolves around the great religious change that occurred in England because it's going to carry over. It's going to carry 3,500 miles across the Atlantic Ocean uh, to North America and to our past. It'd be the second chapter uh, of our past. The Reformation in England, again, was the result of one man. And this was King Henry VIII. Henry's motives were not the motives of Martin Luther. The king's motives were entirely selfish. Uh, great consequences from those uh, motives uh, uh, of the king. And, and this is what Henry VIII was, was all about. Uh, he was married uh, and had a daughter, but no son. In a monarchy, sons are much preferable uh, to uh, daughters. And Henry was without a son, to keep the line going in strong male hands, in other words. Henry was without a son. He came to believe that the reason for his failure to have a son was that his marriage had been cursed by God for some some reason, or not a reason I'm going to go into, uh, and that he needed a divorce so that he could remarry. Now, you're a king. The only where you can go to get a divorce is Rome. The only person who can annul your marriage uh, is the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. And Henry's request, he was already in love with, with another woman, so he's very disappointed when his request was turned down. He decided to take matters into his own hands at that point. Uh, he prepared to divorce his wife, Catherine, himself, and to marry the woman he was in love with, Anne Boleyn, at first secretly, but then it would, as it should, he thought, become, become public. And as that is going on, he is going to put forward laws before the parliament, before the representative institution of England. He's going to propose what we would call bills that would formally separate the church in England from the Roman Catholic Church an act of separation or an act of secession, taking the Church of England, taking the Church in England out of Roman control 
and putting it in whose control you think? Putting it in the monarch's control, his control. They began the legislative process. It's called the Reformation Parliament. It's in the middle of the page, of the, the only page we have on this. Uh, and the Reformation Parliament enacted all of the bills that the king, that the king put forward, uh, just as he expected uh, it, it would. He, he was wise to take it through Parliament uh, because it gives the law, it gives the changes added, added stature as they come by with some degree of popular, some degree of uh, representative uh, assent is what I'm trying to say. Uh, in 1534, by this time he's married Anne Boleyn. She will prove to be a flash in the pan, uh, and he will soon seek to divorce her, succeeded, of course, and behead her. He, he had her executed, beheaded uh, as well. In all, he's going to be married six times, uh, five divorces. Of the five divorcees, two, are, two I think, are executed. Uh, anyway, uh, by 1534, he is putting before Parliament the most important of the acts of separation, and that is called the Act of Supremacy. And the Act of Supremacy will uh, inquire every adult male in England to swear an oath of loyalty to the king as the head of the Christian church, to be known as the Church of England or the Anglican Church. In America, it'll be called the Episcopalian Church. The measure passed, and almost everybody was sympathetic with Protestant ideas enough to take the oath of supremacy. One man wasn't. Now, I talked a few minutes ago about the Christian humanists and how they came right up to the edge of separation, but saw so much good in what the church had once been. Back in all of those centuries before, when the church had saved civilization, when Rome went down. They believed that the old institution was old for a reason it was worth hanging on to. And Thomas More one of the great English humanists, would not take that oath, though he knew it meant his life. He and the king had once been friends, but for More, it was a question of conscience. A great movie about Thomas More and King Henry VIII called A Man for All Seasons. Good movie to see. More refused to take the oath, though he knew it meant his life. And in 1535, 1536, uh, he, was, he, he was executed. He was beheaded in the Tower of London, not far from where Anne Boleyn uh, had been uh, beheaded just a few short years uh, ahead. And so what we have at the end here is a church that has undergone a permanent split. The older Catholic, the newer Protestant. That's a Reformation. And there's a third wedge as well. There's a third split in the mix. And that has come within the Protestant side. There are now two kinds of Protestant faiths. There is the faith that Martin Luther laid down, followed by Lutherans. And there is the legal edifice, the legal structure that King Henry has put the English through to create the Church of England or the Anglican Church. So a Christian world that's been unified at this point for 1,500 years uh, is now beginning to fragment, and we, we haven't seen but the beginning of it. We haven't seen but the beginning of it yet. One last cautionary note. Uh, We'll begin next time with Luther's rule about political obedience on the Protestant side being disregarded with enormous consequences. And then in the second half of class last time, we'll see that the old church, the Catholic church, might have been down, but it wasn't out. And it's going to come back, it's going to come back like, like a lion 
Uh, there is a Catholic Reformation as well as the Reformations that we've been talking about. We'll talk next Thursday. We're, we're going to get this uh, up as soon as we can, starting tonight, Sunday. Uh, we want to get it done as timely as we can. Uh, you don't need to worry to look for it. We will send you an email when, when the process is completed. But here it is Sunday night. We're hoping that it'll be ready to go Tuesday and repeat for Thursday. Okay, we're set.